Good morning. The vast sea of faces today. <laughs> it's good to see all the healthy people in the house of the Lord today. If you're sick, doors are in the back. Y'all just, no. <clears throat> or come on up here and we'll lay hands on you and pray for you. Let's put our gloves on first. But no, it's good to see everybody this morning. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. It has been a wonderful week. Uh, the family and I have gotten out and we've been looking at the sights and Yesterday we found ourselves in caves looking at Christmas lights, so it was a, that was a rather fun an experience. Uh, happy anniversary to the Hendersons. Bless your heart, Misty, for so many years of putting up with him. <clears throat> so I hope you all had a wonderful, wonderful anniversary. I hope you all had a very Merry Christmas. Um, just a few announcements. Uh, we are working on a lot of things over in the student room over there. We're having a lot of fun. Um, we're putting together some special uh, stage pieces over there that's going to require about 1,500 nails to be driven in. And I've done the math, and that's going to be about 25 hours worth of work. And I know what some of you are thinking, well, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning, and I'd hammer in the evening. Well, if you have a hammer and you want to come hammer some nails, take out some frustration over in our student room, we'll be over there the next couple of days, uh, reworking a lot of stuff that I'm not going to say because I have students in here and it's a surprise. But uh, if you guys want to uh, have a little extra time, y'all want to come over and help us do some work in there, we'd love to have you. My wife is giving me a look. Yeah, okay, anybody can build a box. I don't know if anybody can build a box in this place, but I think we'll get that. I think maybe. <clears throat> But either way, if you're free, and, and ladies, if you don't like to maybe nail things, but you like to maybe put things on walls or, or that sort of thing, uh, we could certainly use that help. So if you're free over the next couple of days, you got, but not a student, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're over the age of 18 and, uh, and you're not in the student ministry, and you're welcome to come and join us, and uh, we're having a good time over there. Also, one other announcement, weather looks a little sketchy this evening. And so we are going to uh, go ahead and hold off on evening services tonight. So no services tonight. Everybody just hunker down in your favorite tornado shelter, and uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a good time. So that being said, I'm going to open us up. <coughs> yeah, I go, I'll preach uh, you know, next month sometime. Y'll just, I'll, just have to, I'll just have to wait on my Christmas message again, and y'all just have to wait till January to hear that one. So, But I don't know. We're going to... Missy and Mr. Raby for an extra time today. Just, I got to say, uh, it was so cute. Paisley brought me a, a little drawing she did for me this morning. I couldn't tell if it was Baby Yoda or old Mr. Raby, but either way, it was kind of cute. So, <laughs> The ears were about the same, so I couldn't tell, but <laughs> let me, uh, I think we need to pray. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gracious God, we thank you that we can be in your house. Lord, I thank you for laughter. Um, Lord, you, you have given us all these emotions, and, and you've created us in such an amazing way that, that we can laugh, and we can have joy, and we can have fellowship, and, and what a wonderful time that is, Lord, and uh, what a great reminder of Christmas, joy to the world. The Savior has come. We thank you for that. We thank you for the peace that comes from that on whom you favor. Lord, we're so blessed because of that. Lord, I pray that our time this morning would be a blessing to you. I thank you that your word says, where two or more gathered, there you are also. And we know that here in this place, the Spirit of God is. And I pray that we would remember that, we would focus on you, and that we would worship you this morning. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Brother Billy. Let's take our hymnals, turn to 386. Brethren, we have met to worship, 386. We'll be going right into 378. Would you stand, please?
Good to see you, and I appreciate your kind thoughts to me and my family uh, during the Christmas season for the, the gifts that the church has given to us and the staff, and for all the cards and the letters, and for the well wishes for our anniversary. Um, we just turned number 28, so now I can tell everybody we're working on 29 years, and uh, that always gets everybody excited thinking we've been married longer than we have. And uh, we went to eat last night, and the little lady that was waiting on us, um, I told her, I said, tonight's our anniversary. I said, we've been married 28 years, and I could tell she looked sort of suspicious. And I said, well, she was in kindergarten when we got married. I said, that's why she looked so young. She said, I wouldn't imagine y'all were old enough to have been married 
28 years. And I was uh, sharing with Miss Margaret this morning that it seems like the older I get, the sweeter it gets. You know, I, I was basically an only child, you know, kind of raised with uh, older parents and, and pretty well spoiled. And I've, I've transitioned in life somewhat from what do I want to what can I do for my wife? You know, what can I do for my family? So it's been a sweet time. We do have a lot of folks that are out sick. Um, flu's taking shape, seems like pretty heavy. Um, the just general cough. We've got some bronchitis going on. Um, we've got some, some issues with the, uh, the, the virus going around. So if you see that somebody's not here, you know, call them and check on them. You know, and let them know that you miss them. And just tell them that you love them. And see if there's anything that we can do for them. So let's open in prayer. And we'll see what the Lord has for us this morning. Father, we thank You so much for Your grace and, Father, Your mercy. God, for just being good to us, Lord. Father, for allowing us to be in Your house this morning, to be with our brothers and sisters. Lord, my mind just goes back to our Sunday school class this morning. And, Father, how You tried Your best, Lord, to make Balak not go. Make Balaam do right. To make all those people, Father, follow You. And You ended up using a donkey. And Father, I just pray this morning, Lord, that You open our eyes like You did theirs. That, Father, we see what You have for us. Father, for those that are sick and hurting this morning, Lord, that You'd give them peace, give them a touch. Father, for those that are grieving the passing of loved ones, that, God, You'd just hold them near and dear to Your heart. And let, let us, as the brothers and the sisters, Father, reach out to continue to give them comfort and peace. Father, for Your Word this morning, Lord, I pray that it speaks, that it gives us something to think about, Lord, that it gives us pause. And Father, for the weather that is moving in, God, I just pray that You just hide us in the cleft of the rock, Lord. You've taken such good care of us as a community, Lord. And Father, I just pray that, that You continue that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. We're looking at post-Christmas. And I do hope everybody's had a good time. You got together with friends and family, co-workers, colleagues, whatever. And uh, maybe exchanged gifts, had some meals, had some good fellowship. And uh, now that Christmas is gone in the life of Jesus. He's, he's already been born. We've been talking about new beginnings. And there's so many times with a new beginning, there's always time for a change. And um, I know in my life, I just went through some of the shirts that I don't wear and uh, pack those up and pass those on to be a blessing to someone else. Misty washed them and folded them, had them ready to go. We were able to pass those on. It's kind of good to be able to get shirts in and out of the closet without having to arm wrestle, you know, to get those in and out. You know, it's good to have change in your life. And we're almost to the point of January 1 where everybody's going to make New Year's resolutions. What am I going to do different in my life? What am I going to change? Am I going to alter my diet, start an exercise program, fill in the blank, you know, give up coffee or, or soft drinks or whatever it is? We're always looking for some type of change. And you know, change is supposed to be good, right? It's supposed to be good when you are, are blessed to be able to go and purchase another vehicle. But sometimes that change brings with it some heartaches. Some of us remember when we changed a vehicle that had the foot-operated dimmer switch to one that was up on the steering column, and how aggravating it was to have to get your foot up there you know, to dim the headlights, and you'd get tangled up in the steering wheel and you'd run off in the ditch. How about when you drive a different vehicle and you have to put gas in it, and the gas cap is not on this side, it's over on this side. Or now when you open it up, there's not even a gas cap. Somebody's already stole your gas cap on your new car. You know, it just... Sometimes change is, is very concerning. Um... We've gone from a generation of writing letters and mailing those off to sending text messages by our telephones. You know, we no longer just associate with folks like we used to. Now we do it kind of incognito across the airways. So in Matthew chapter 2, if you're there with me, 
And I apologize, I think my microphone is going on the blitz. Uh, Matthew chapter 2, and I'll read the first 12 verses. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Microphone, if that's okay. So the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. For some of us, this is a very familiar story that we've heard just about all of our life. I mean, we've, we've, some of us have been in Christmas plays since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, and we saw the three wise men and We always say they were three wise men because they had three gifts. And then you get into an argument with somebody about how many were they really? Were they actually Chinese? Were they Japanese? Were they some other ease? You know, we've all heard the story, hopefully. But it's the story of of, of some wise, learned people that were watching for a new beginning. They were watching for a change. And they came to King Herod to find out where was this to be born the king of the Jews. And that's what I want us to think about this morning. I want us to get ourselves in the mindset of Herod, and I want to get ourselves in the mindset of his kingdom and how this affected them. We see the wise men as they come in and they they worship the baby Jesus, the, the young child Jesus, a lot of arguments about that as well. They bring the gifts and they they leave and they go another way because they knew Herod was up to no good. So the first thing I want us to look at is being perplexed personally. Now go back to Herod. In verse 3, the Bible says that Herod was troubled. He was was troubled as was all of Jerusalem. Now, your translation may say distressed. Your translation may disturbed, say disturbed. I like to use the word perplexed because perplexed means it's complicated. And that's kind of how this is. It's complicated that Herod was very troubled. Now, a little background and history on Herod. Herod was born in southern Palestine. And right immediately, your mind is going to go to the conflict that's over in the Middle East with Israel and Palestine. His father, Antipater, and I'm probably butchering that, was an Edomite, meaning he was a Semitic people, identified by some scholars as being Arabic converted to Judaism somewhere around 2nd century BC. He was granted Roman citizenship by Julius Caesar and he was named king of Judea by the Roman government, their their senate council. An interesting fact is he tussled over land with Cleopatra. You know her? She was the queen of Egypt. She would send her lover Antony over there and and he would kind of smooth up to Herod and give a little land and lose a little land, and Herod didn't realize that, and that caused great angst as well. kind of leads to the fact that Herod was always looking over his shoulder. Herod was a mental nutcase, and there's really no other way to say it. 
He had fears that were fed by his sister, Salome, who in fact poisoned Herod's enemies. So here you've got King Herod sitting on the throne and the sister yang yang in the ear about how this one's trying to overthrow you and that one's trying to overthrow you. And when Herod had had enough, the sister would go and, po- and poison those people. He was afraid of the fragile title he held, which was given to him as an outsider, not earned as one from the inside. He was paranoid he would lose his title and position as not only king of Judah, or Judea, but king of the Jews. He was so paranoid that he murdered his beloved wife, Mary Amney. He married, murdered her two sons, her brother, her grandfather, her mother, all because he feared them taking his throne. So here come these three wise men riding into town into verse 2, and they strode up to Herod, and they say, Herod, where is this one to be born called the king of the Jews? Was Herod about to lose his throne? Was there a change coming? Was there a new beginning about to be forced upon him? What's ever happened in our life, a new beginning or a change, that caused us some uneasiness? Maybe it's trying to break in a new pair of shoes. Maybe it's moving to a new house and having to turn left instead of turning to the right. Maybe it's moving to a new office or to a new school or a transitionary phase in your life. But when those changes come, when those new beginnings come, do they not get complicated though sometimes? Herod was deeply troubled that his way of life was about to change. How many of us can truly accept change open-heartedly? Maybe it's a change in our health. You ever have that? Life as you knew it is going to have to be altered from here for the remainder. Maybe it's changes in lifestyle. You've gone to the doctor and the doctor says, listen, you're going to have to cut out whatever it is. I mean, I've done that most all of my life, and now you're telling me I can no longer do that? How about lifestyle changes as far as your service to God? Has God ever called you to do something and you've never done that before? Maybe it's teach. Maybe it's fill in and service somewhere. Maybe God is calling you to the ministry. What is it that perplexes us? See, we're sitting on our throne of our life. And we've got a title of what our life looks like. And God may be trying to change some of the knobs. What complicates our life? Is it the unknown? Man, I don't like the unknown. I like knowing exactly what's going to happen, exactly when it's going to happen. Somebody asked me out front, do I have the radars on my phone I said absolutely I can tell you within minutes how it's probably going or not going to rain most of the time it's because I'm standing outside in it trying to see what the cloud looks like the unknown what about the uncomfortable have you ever been put in a tough situation what about any and all changes I like my life just exactly the way it is now. I don't want anything to change. I've got my life just the way I want it to be. When the pressure is on us, how do we react? Maybe it depends upon the day. Mondays aren't good. Saturdays aren't good. Maybe it's the time of the day. First thing in the morning before I have my cup of coffee is not good. Last thing in the end of the day when I'm trying to get in the bed... Not a good time. What about how close we are to Jesus? See, when we get squeezed, Jesus' juice ought to run out of us instead of lemon juice or instead of worldly juice. Not just being perplexed personally, but I want you to see how they were uneasy corporately. Because you see back in verse 3, it says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. It wasn't just Herod that was upset. Because Herod was upset, everybody else was upset. Your translation may say distressed 
or it may say disturbed. I say uneasy because it's uncomfortable, restless, disturbed, perturbed. Just imagine the land of Judah. Just imagine living under the rule of a non-Jewish king. He grabbed that throne because somebody that was imposing corporate law over them put him there in place to rule over them. The Romans were not particularly loved. So somebody set over them by the Romans was not going to be particularly loved. And how do you gain more kingdoms? Well, you gain more kingdoms because of war. Didn't like war. Living under the threat of a king who's just a basic mental case. You don't know how his mood is going to change. Seeing and hearing that persons have been executed simply because they were perceived as a threat to the throne. What happened to the queen? Well, she got poisoned. What happened to her family? Well, they got poisoned. Where are the two sons? Well, Herod didn't like them. Now add to the mix these wise men riding into town. Just imagine those that were standing there to see this. And I'm sure this was an entourage because these men were wealthy. I mean, they had the means to buy the, the great gifts that were given to Jesus. They had the means to be educated enough to understand the stars and the solar system to know that there was something out of place, that there was a star coming. And they had to have known prophecy to know what was said in the Old Testaments. Just imagine the entourage and the crowd that it drew and the people that came in to see what was going on when they heard them say, tell us where this one is that is born to be king of the Jews. Imagine the gasps. Imagine everybody looking to Herod all of a sudden saying, what's Herod going to say now? He's going to come unglued. He's going to kill everybody he can see or everybody he can think of. Imagine the fear and the dread that swept over the people. Imagine them racking their brains trying to appease or avoid the uneasy King Herod. The people knew that Herod was feverishly jealous of his throne. The people knew there would be a heavy price paid. If you look on over in chapter 2, verses 16 through 18, Herod sent out a decree and killed all the male children from two years old and under. I mean, he wanted to make sure he annihilated whatever the threat was, even if it was a baby. How could a baby be a threat to a king? How could a toddler, the innocent, how could they pose a threat? They were a potential threat in the making in Herod's mind. Are you ever worried about something that never came true? I mean, you just frazzled yourself trying to come up with a scenario and a way to get out of this and avoid this and whatever this, and it never really happened. And here Herod takes that to the nth degree and kills all these babies. Sometimes, though, the smallest things cause the greatest concerns, don't they? We get so worked up. Much ado about nothing is the playwright wrote. How hard is it to live with unstable persons? They're always changing directions. They're going here, they're going there, they're going back over here, they're going back over there. Never the same personality twice. You may leave them in a good mood one minute and you come back and they're just as mad as they can be and they don't even know why they're mad, let alone you. Maybe they're jealous. Maybe they have unhinged rage. Maybe they're slaves to addiction. See, all these things were going on in the life of King Herod. How hard is it to live with unstable Christians? On fire for Jesus one minute and cold as ice the next? Affecting those around us in a negative light constantly? Living in the world while claiming a home in heaven? You see how that could push people away? Why are new beginnings so scary? People say, well, we've never done it like this before. We've never seen it like this before. Maybe we don't know how to do it a new way. We're too old to learn that new trick. How many of us are uncomfortable because God is calling us to change and we're pushing back against God? 
You want to see somebody that's really miserable? You go look at a child of God that's outside of God's will. You'll never see a more miserable person. Lastly, nationally secure. We've talked about how we're personally perplexed. We've talked about how everybody around us is uneasy corporately. Now what about how do we get to be nationally secure? Well, in verses 5 and 6, they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. God would produce a governor. A governor being the representative of the crown. Now when you think about representing the crown, who is the crown? It's God the Father. Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherein he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Well, let me ask you this. Who is representative to us? Who do those around us see as our representative? What drives us? Not only would he be a governor, but he would rule God's people, which is the nation of Israel. Isaiah 9, 6 said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. But the question is, who or what is our ruler today? What drives us? What motivates us? What or who are those around us See, ruling us. Is it our temper or our anger? Is it our addictions? Is it our wants and our desires? Or is it a true desire to serve Jesus Christ? Herod's rule was about to end. Isaiah 11, 6 through 9 talks about what peace there will be when Christ sets things new. And this is a foreshadowing of what was to happen when Herod would be no more. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockerous den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord." as the waters cover the sea. But what strife is in our life today? What is it that's causing us such angst? What are we struggling with today? What is evident to those around us, but maybe not to us? Just like the donkey in our Sunday school lesson this morning, the donkey could see the angel with the sword drawn ready to slay them, but nobody else could. You ever have an instance where it's obvious? We made a joke about it this morning about how we, we leave the house and we'll say, hey, does this look good on me? And they'll say, oh, sure it does. And then a true friend will say, I cannot believe you wore that outside the house. Well, to me it looked great when I left the house, but it's obvious to you, but it's not obvious to me. Herod's rule would end and so would the oppression. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Do you have hope? What is it that you hope for, not just in this life, but in the afterlife? What do you long for? It's just something that you just can't wait to see happen. It may be that you've got your hopes and dreams set on something here, something temporal, and we're overlooking what's yet to come in the afterlife. How are those around us seeing hope in us? How are those around us seeing that longing for Christ, for heaven? How do they see that in us? If all I talk about is money and things and possessions and what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go, that doesn't give them hope for eternal life. That doesn't give them something to long for in eternal life. 
Yes, I'd like to be with Jesus right now, but you know that's passing condemnation on those that aren't ready. But I talk to folks and they say, you know, the older I get, the more I've got to look forward to on the other side. And my hope is in Jesus Christ. I long for the day when everything is set right. Another important point of no more Herod is there would be no more fear of death. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, we're familiar with it. It says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is our victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do we fear death? You know, I think about that a lot. Do I fear it? Maybe the act thereof, but not what's going to happen afterwards. John 10, 10. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Do you, you can't have life if you're fearing death. What about those around us? You ever talk to somebody about their salvation and they admit to you that they know that they're going to bust the gates of hell wide open? And I mean, they tell you that with eyes open, maybe not a smile on their face, but they know that their eternity is sealed unless something changes. And you try and you try to convince them that they need to give their life to Jesus Christ, but they continue to refuse to do so. How do they live like that? Are those around us, do they fear death? I don't want to die. You know, it's only when the hard times come that people have to face that reality. Where are we going to spend eternity? Maybe it's time for a change. We're about to set those New Year's resolutions. We're about to try to figure out how we can change for next year based upon what we've done this year, looking at our budget, looking at our income. Is there time for a change? Maybe it's time to lay down those personal struggles. Don't be like Herod and continue looking over your shoulder, worried about what is. Live for Jesus. Live for the now. Live for today. Maybe it's time to spread the good news of Jesus around us. How long has it been since you shared your testimony with somebody? I mean, have you ever shared your testimony? And that's something that's unique and personal to everyone in this room if you know Jesus Christ. How did you give your life to Jesus and what good has he done for you? Do people know that about you? Maybe it's time to lay our hand to the plow and start laying out those rows so that the, that the, the crops can be planted and souls can be harvested. Is it time for a change in, in your life to give your life to Jesus Christ? Start serving him today. We've all got things going on in our life personally. We've got things that are affecting those around us. But, you know, I'm ready to be secure as a nation. I'm ready to be secure as all those around me. They know where to come when the hard times hit. They know to go to see the preacher. They know to go to see the guy in the corner office. But what about in the good times? Are we praising God for the good times in our life? Maybe it's time for a change. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes.